All right, it's my pleasure to uh, chair this final session, and we have one plenary, Jonathan Weber's plenary after this session. Uh, our first of two talks in this session is by Storm Hedder uh, from East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania with the title, Look, a White Philosopher, Sartrean Roots of the Black Existential Thought of Angela Davis and Lewis Gordon. And as we've been doing, if you could just tell us a little bit about what you've been working on, how this kind of fits in with what you've been doing, and then you can get started. Thank you. All right, um, wonderful. Thanks so much. And um, I wanna begin by thanking uh, both Jeff and Henry. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about myself in a, a second here. Um, I really found the prompt um, fun. I found the title fun, start now. I, I got into the exclamation point. So you'll see some exclamation points and a couple question marks in there. Um, and as a person who is not really familiar much with Deleuze, I, I really enjoyed going to find that quote where it came from. Um, the prompt, uh, you know, said we think of Sartre to somebody from a bygone era, um, and we're the ones who are conformists. Um, and yet Deleuze says, uh, Sartre remains my teacher. Um, so I found that really, really interesting. Um, now, in terms of who I am, my name is T. Storm Heater. Um, I'm a philosopher from Pennsylvania. Uh, I live in Stroudsburg uh, in the United States. The university where I've been teaching for the last 19 years is called East Stroudsburg University. It's a regional school in Pennsylvania, um, drawing mostly from Philadelphia and the Lehigh Valley. And the university itself um, has acknowledged that the land and the soil that we're on is originally the homeland of the Lenape, of uh, the indigenous people. Um, and I will come back to this and why it's important in a minute. Um, so I've, I've let you know that there is a little land acknowledgement and we'll talk about what that is. Um, if you wanna keep in touch with me, I'd love that. You can be in touch with me on Twitter. Um, that's an easy place and, and you can Google my name and, and email me. In terms of SART, um, I wrote my PhD on SART back in 2003 under William Schroeder. And I've continued to work in and around um, Sartrean stuff, existentialist stuff. Um, and I've been involved with the North American SART Society and the UK SART Society. And again, I, I just wanna thank the organizers again, Jeff and Henry. Um, and all the participants so far, both from the, you know, Professor Howell's idea of the, the spiral, which I actually, I think about that a lot. I've been thinking about the spiral a lot for, for many years. So that was wonderful. Look forward to Jonathan's talk tomorrow. Um, I mean, the, right after mine. Um, and, and also so many of the panelists really have, have raised questions that are directly relevant. So some things I might reference and skip. So again, thanks so much uh, for organizing this conference on SART now. And uh, following what Deleuze says about SART, I, I, I hope that the rhythm of these existential examples works okay. Um, SART now, what does that mean? Well, to me, that means responding to the situation, situation. And in 2020, as we all know, there was a lynching that was so public in the United States that it shocked white people. Um, so lynchings, as we know, are old. Um, why did this shock white people? Why was there a different reaction? That's gonna be my theme. My theme is going to be, look a white philosopher. And I don't understand philosophers as somehow different from people. And again, that goes back to Deleuze thinking about Sartre. He had a life outside of the institution of the university. This image comes from uh, my own community here in Stroudsburg. Um, the images that I have here reveal how youth culture and youth movement in the United States are reconceptualizing whiteness by thinking about the engagement with Black Lives Matter as white people. So if you look at these two signs, I'm not black, but I will fight for BLM. I understand that I will never understand. So the problem of whiteness was really acutely felt in the United States and, and I'll argue globally um, after the lynching of George Floyd um, and Breonna Taylor, George Floyd's was a little different because it was on video for everybody to see played over and over. Um, 
I'm so excited. There's so much work on Black Orpheus at this conference, and uh, I, I'm not sure if it, you know the the future of of of, of Sart now will be some kind of a book project or whatnot with um, you know Jeff and Henry. But I think that it's really fascinating how many folks are working on Black Orpheus, um, and I'm joining them. So the line from Black Orpheus that sticks out to me is, I hope that you, like me, will feel the shock of being seen. Again, these are more signs from US protest movements um, in my community. I, I've seen similar signs elsewhere, but again, white silence is violence, uh, end white supremacy. And again, this is a white engagement with white supremacy. Now, what would Sartre say about this? Well, 1948, he was already saying something about it. So again, the spiral of rereading a preface that was just one of you know, thousands of words that, that, that Sartre gave us. And yet in 2022, um, there's something about what he said in Black Orpheus that I feel is very important as humans and as philosophers. And it really has to do with shame as several of our panelists have already talked about, what we might call white double consciousness following W.E.B. Du Bois. So let's enter into the realm of philosophy and how philosophers think about whiteness. So Lauren Dugraff has a recent essay in Yale French Studies uh, 2020. Uh, it's a great volume that has a lot of good work in there, including you know, a piece by Berlusconi on America Day by Day, um, et cetera. And she just offers a challenge. She, she just wonders if existentialism is a white club. And I think the image is powerful. So I, I leave a lot of these images up there. The absence here is Fanon. Um, so why would there not be Fanon here? Um, is existentialism a white club? And, and again, you'll learn throughout the presentation that um, noticing whiteness and pointing out whiteness sometimes is felt as an attack because of the feeling of shame. I prefer to think of it as a gift, and, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So this is not an attack on Sarah Bakewell. Um, she gave the keynote at the North American Sart Society back in 2019, maybe, um, and was great, and I love this book. Um, so we have this philosophical question, is existentialism a white club that's raised by DuGraff? Well, in the context that we're thinking about with this start now, um, we have a Francophone philosopher, a French philosopher who has been received in the English speaking world and the Anglophone world, which is very wide, of course, England uh, and the United States being part of it. And so I'm wondering what is Sartre's place in all of these different national contexts where whiteness might mean something different? Well, in France, the concept of whiteness is itself something that is discussed. The popular press um, throws a fit over the word whiteness and the question of whether uh, blanchité is even a legitimate French word um, has generated a lot of discussion. Um, Christine um, Taubra mentions a theme that will be recurrent in my presentation how to teach the world there is no black question, neither in France or elsewhere, but there is a white issue with regards to indifference. Critical whiteness studies. Okay, this is a new area um, of the last 30 years, which is drawing on very old traditions in um, black thought and indigenous thought especially. So when we think about critical whiteness studies as a contemporary field um, rooted in you know David Rodiger's work in the 1990s and some other folks. There's a contemporary critical whiteness studies that is carried out mostly by um, whites in the academy. A lot of their work is really dependent upon work that earlier critics did, um, often outside of the institution of philosophy, often in things like autobiography. So when I think about critical whiteness studies today, it's both new and exciting, and it's also very old. So for example, when W.E.B. Du Bois and, you know, the, the turn from the, you know, 19th into the 20th century says it's, you know, the color line is the problem, and what we need to focus on is, is whiteness. That's something that um, 
American academics caught on to, American white academics caught on to about 100 years later. So where are we now? Well, I would say one of the main places to look is Sarah Ahmed, especially her 27, 2007 paper, A Phenomenology of Whiteness, where she says simply, if whiteness gains currency by being unnoticed, then what does it mean to notice whiteness? So um, there's an explosion of work, and, and some of you probably know about this work, and I'd love to hear ideas about what you think um, the good stuff in critical whiteness studies is. So um, Ahmed is part of it. Okay, well, what about SART? SART now. Um, if we're reading SART now and as part of the spiral of, uh, you know, just a text that was written in 47 or 48, you know, where do we see the influence? I'm focusing on two philosophers, uh, Angela Davis and Lewis R. Gordon, that undoubtedly everybody knows about because they have transcended just being academic philosophers and they've become people who have created movements or been involved with movements. Um, so that's one of the reasons Davis and Gordon are interesting in terms of a Sartrean legacy because Sartre was not primarily a, a philosophy professor. And so in a way, even though Davis was trained in philosophy, uh, read French, uh, went to Germany, um, studied under Marcuse, you know, we don't primarily understand her as a professor. We understand her as something else. Um, um, so it's interesting, you know, she's a philosopher um, and how does philosopher sometimes transcend being a professor? I would say the same for Lewis R. Gordon. Um, and I wanna look at their work as a moment, especially in the United States, um, when the reception of, of, of Sartre and existentialism moved from a colorblind reception focusing on being um, and bad faith um, and freedom in, in, in the sense of consciousness to something um, else. And I'll talk about that in a second. We also have George Yancey, Naomi Zak, Mabogo P. Moore. And to me, um, I, I, I'm excited by the prompt. Start now, exclamation point, because I see so much work. And so part of what I did to prepare is just try to start thinking about who's doing the work, where things are going, and have that conversation with everyone here about where they think the work is going and, and who they're drawing on and, and which things are alive and dead and, and, and where we go with that. So in terms of me and my palette that I draw on, um, I just wanna list a few influences and then get to my, my main claims about Angela Davis uh, and, and Lewis R. Gordon. So let's start with uh, Catherine Sophia Bell. She's got a forthcoming book on Beauvoir and Bell. Uh, her previous book is called Hannah Arendt and the Negro Question. And it's a really important um, look at whiteness and trying to problematize whiteness instead of problematizing blackness and Jewishness. Um, another book that's recent that is influential is Simone de Beauvoir and the Colonial Experience by uh, Natalie Naya. And I, I apologize, these are the fonts so small, it's hard to see the names. I can provide those for you. Naya also looks at existentialism, both Sartre and Beauvoir, and the question of whiteness in relation to colonialism. Uh, this other third book here is by Glenn Coulthard, um, drawing on uh, Fanon, but also Sartre. Red Skin, White Masks, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition. Again, this is a person coming out of this framework of, of whiteness studies and existentialism and, and looking at its application to uh, in, indigenous studies um, and land. And then a couple other books, and then I'll, I'll kind of move on. Um, Michael Monahan, uh, who wrote his thesis on Jean-Paul Sartre, also at Illinois, um, he has a forthcoming book. This is his first book called The Creolizing Subject, again, where he uses uh, existential thought to talk about whiteness um, and, and to talk about the, the myth of purity. So when he says creolizing subject, he's really interested in the, the myth of whiteness, um, the idea that white is somehow pure um, and that it could be tainted uh, by a drop of, of something, of blood. Another book that's very important in this area is uh, LaRose Paris's book, Being a Part, 
which draws a lot on Lewis Gordon um, and Angela Davis. And the key move there is to look at um, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, in connection with um, Black existential thinkers in the US, especially Frederick Douglass. Um, so she really is good at looking at uh, Frederick Douglass um, and Jean-Paul Sartre. This third book here is uh, recently out, uh, just came out in 2020 by Mabogo Percy Moore. And the book is called Start on Contingency, Anti-Black Racism and Embodiment. Um, very important book. It's, it's just getting out there. I, I hope that you have a chance to read it. It's uh, available in paperback for $30. Um, and it really is an important contemporary living existential Sartre now engagement by a Black philosopher who situates himself uh, within an anti-Black world, um, that of South Africa. And Mabogo Moore draws on his earlier work, uh, arguing that uh, existentialism and existential thought is a very strong tradition in South Africa. Not only Steve Biko, the freedom fighter, was an existentialist, um, but also the psychologist Mangani. And so what Moore is doing is he's really, uh, you know, up, updating this project. What, is it, what does it mean to, to struggle with um, Sartrean ideas about contingency? And the interesting thing there is that he's looking at early Sartre. Um, and then the last book over there is, is my, my book that just came out. Uh, it's also a, a companion here to Mabogo's book um, on the Roman Littlefield International uh, Living Existentialism book series. Uh, where I do draw in my book a lot on Sartre. Um, I'd also just suggest people look at the latest Sartre Studies International, um, um, which just came out um, in, in 2021 here, uh, which is on Sartre and anti-racism or existentialism and anti-racism. So um, I guest edited that and I, I, I really got a great look at the work of uh, not only Natalie Mabogo, but also Thomas Maher, um, Falu Sam, Lashaba, uh, Danielle Stephen Cervantes, Laura McMahon, Emma McNichol, Justin Fugo, um, Eddie Byrne, Catherine Sophia Bell, Bernasconi, and, and, and then Judican. So whew, there's a lot going on, and I, I feel very full um, when, I'm, when I'm talking about these things, because to me, it's a community, and I really think that this you know, this conference uh, seems to be in the spirit of community. Um, so I, I knew I would get through about four slides. I think I'm on slide six now. Um, so I did send you the slides so you can look at them at any point. So start now, where are we? Well, um, we're in an era where it seems like inside and outside the academy, we are willing collectively to acknowledge white supremacy and to acknowledge that white supremacy is the political system uh, that has made the modern world what it is, uh, to, to quote uh, Charles Mills. So white supremacy now is on the table in a way that capitalism had been on the table for quite a while. Um, so where do we start? Well, I mean, we start with the West and we start with Hume and Kant who were explicitly philosophizing about whiteness and were explicitly white supremacists, David Hume saying, there never was any civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even any individual eminent in action. Kant echoing that, and uh, Kant interestingly says that, you know, even the lowest white, um, some continually rise aloft through their superior gifts, earn respect in these worlds. So in the United States, this has a very precise formulation um, and the formulation is, I may be poor, but at least I'm not black. So we can see that in 18th century thought. 18th century thought, um, enlightenment thought, uh, um, should be read uh, in conjunction with colonialism and the slave trade. All right, so we have this history of, of Western thought with, you know, the continental tradition. Where does Sartre fit in, in, into this? Um, Anti-Semite and Jew. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful text with all these spirals. So I, again, I just had a couple different images to, for us to think about. Um, 
and uh, you know, um, we heard from one of our presenters yesterday about Walzer's uh, discussion of anti-Semite and Jew, and it, it's so exciting that something written in the 40s in a specific context gets republished and taken back up at different moments, and and it's those moments that tell us a lot about us um, and start at the same time. So, okay, anti-Semite and Jew, what does this have to do with whiteness? Well, he says there that, that the Jewish problem is born of the anti-Semite and famously draws on Richard Wright as, as Beauvoir will. There's no Negro problem in the US, there's only a white problem, boom. So this is the move from problematizing blackness and, and negritude to problematizing whiteness, okay? So what does it mean to problemize whiteness? Well, it means to think about whiteness and being white or being white in the world as potentially problematic, um, ontologically, epistemologically, ethically, um, just to start that conversation, let's say that the connection between whiteness and being white and white supremacy is one that raises these questions. Now, why, why the white problem or the white question? Well, it's a response to a longer history of, of racial thought in which discussions of race were uh, asked as questions or problems. So in France, you have the Jewish question. Um, in fact, there were some issues, right, translating um, anti-Semite and Jew because the Anglophone said, you know, we don't know if saying the Jewish question is actually going to be the best translation. Um, you know, in Germany, you have the, the Jüdische Frage. I know Marx writes about this. And in the U.S., we have the Negro problem. So what Sartre was doing um, and what other existential thinkers like Richard Wright were doing is, is they're reversing the look, they're reversing the gaze. White philosophers like Kant and Hume had been gazing outward at black others in order to give a description of the black other that was really a description of their own rationality and their own sense of self. It was a comparison. So can we reverse the gaze and now look at whiteness critically? Well, you get that in a lot of places in Sartre. So again, so so exciting and so many spirals. Um, and um, I'm just laughing because I'm looking at my time. And, and it's okay. It's okay. I sent you the the PowerPoint, and uh, this this is the the nature of my 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 spiral process. Um, so look, we have all this stuff to draw on. You got anti-Semite and Jew. Um, you have the preface to the Wretched of the Earth. Um, I really think looking at the uh, preface um, um, or fin noir is really the place to go for us right now if we want to understand whiteness. So to return to the quote from the beginning, we have all these protest signs with white people in Black Lives Matter movements saying I'm white, but I'm against white supremacy. Um, and so now let's look at this quote. When you remove the gag that was keeping these black mouths shut, what were you hoping for? That they would sing your praises? Here are black men standing, looking at us, and I hope that you, like me, will feel the shock of being seen. So we have this literature of being seen, of being white, of the white confessional. And uh, I was gonna put a standard picture of Sartre over there, and then uh, I did it. So, um, you know, I wonder how Sartre's um, you know, shaming um, work when there's an actor playing him. So there he is looking at us. Uh, and let's imagine him in uh, Black Orpheus saying, I'm now talking to whites. So what does Sartre say about whiteness in um, Black Orpheus? Well, whiteness of the skin becomes another look. Oh, that could be the whole talk right there. The whiteness of the skin is the look, not the eyes, right? It's, it's not the eyes. Um, I mean, as, as, as we talked about in a couple other panels, even noise can create a sense of shame. It's the footsteps in the hall. But here Sartre is focusing on himself, whiteness, and he's focusing on other white people. Instead of trying to legislate what Jewish identity is or black identity, he's trying to think about white identity. Now, he doesn't, he, 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 he doesn't necessarily get it right. 
when he tries to turn to the question of pathologizing whiteness, because he's still in, in Black Orpheus, um, he's still kind of, I think, trying to legislate um, Black identity the way that in um, anti-Semite and Jew, he was trying to legislate Jewish identity. So whose authenticity should he be thinking about? His own as a white person? And that's all there implicitly, but it's through all this language of the authentic Jew and the inauthentic Jew. Well, tell me about you. Don't tell me about my authenticity. Tell me about your authenticity or the authenticity of other white people. So there's all this brilliant, brilliant stuff, but a lot of it's just arrogant. Um, and I, I did have a chance to read the, the Precy from, from Jonathan, and, and Jonathan concludes with listening. And I think that here we're seeing Sard struggle to listen because he loves talking. And this isn't wrong. It's not wrong to say that these words um, have been thrown and now you can pick them up as stones and, and cast them back. But it's not his place to be explaining what negritude is or isn't. Because he come up, comes up to the limit of his experience. He has no experience of negritude. He doesn't have the language or uh, the embodied perspective for that. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip quite a bit of some background stuff. Um, part of my question is why was there a colorblind reception of Sartre in the 50s? So I'm really interested in the early reception of Sartre in the United States from Kaufman to Barrett to Allen. I mean, Sartre's dealing with race and racism in 48, 49. And then in the 50s, what comes to the United States is and England, uh, books about um, you know the human problem of of freedom. They're not taking up anti-Semite and Jew. So you know why? Um, and it's interesting because you know I think a lot of us can trace our own genealogies through the people we studied with, like my professor Richard Schacht, who studied with Walter Kaufman. And these are genealogies of whiteness. And again, this is not to say there's something. Um, uh, you know, wrong with having studied with a white person. There's, there's, the point is to say that there is something white about studying with a white person, that it affects our thought, it affects our questions, and that we need to acknowledge the traditions that we came from. So with, with my two minutes left, um, let's just, let's give the floor to Angela Davis and Lewis Gordon. Um, and again, what provocative philosophers this is my favorite Angela Davis quote. The history of black literature provides a much more illuminating account of the nature of freedom than all the philosophical discourses on this theme in the history of Western society. And you see everybody's face melting in 1969 when she says this. And, and you see philosophers saying, well, that sounds like an activist. That sounds like a placard. You know, this is something that's, and I think that's not wrong. Because why shouldn't we have placards? Why shouldn't we have protest signs coming out of existentialism? Um, does it drain it of its philosophical content? Is this sloppy speech? Is it uh, ret mere rhetoric? So th this quote would be enough for us to understand the Sartrean roots of Black existential thought, which is to say, let's look at how Frederick Douglass talked about freedom. Um, let's look at the embodied uh, perspective of those who were denied freedom. So with, with that essential thought, um, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Lewis Gordon in my last minute here. So 1995, we are in an era when Sartrean studies is somewhat politicized, but most folks are, are focusing on um, freedom in a uh, sense of um, free will and I'm trying to understand the you know relationship between you know human freedom um, of, of, of any subject. And Gordon says, well what about anti-blackness? If we consider anti-blackness a fundamental structure of our world, doesn't it affect choice? And so 1995, bad faith and anti-Black racism forces us to the question, was Sartre a white philosopher? 
Okay, so the first step was, okay, we will acknowledge that there is such a thing as black philosophy. That took a while, right? Because people were like, well, what, why are we calling it a black philosopher, black philosophy? Maybe it's just philosophy. Now my question and my challenge is, are we gonna start labeling our philosophies white philosophies? Is there such a thing as being a white philosopher and what does that mean? So if we take our point of departure from those placards from the beginning, um, being white and taking up our white being in the world is part of anti-racism, as an important part of anti-racism. So with that said, um, I would just encourage people to Google the phrase philosopher, and this one is from google.uk. You can see the what comes up if you Google philosopher. This one is from uh, google.france, so this is philosophe, and you can see what, what pops up there. We all can easily Google the demographics of the departments that we live, uh, that we work in. Um, in the United States, philosophy is a, the least demographically diverse. It's basically 82% white. Um, in the UK, it looks like, although the data is harder to find for me, I, I had a harder time finding it if people have the data, it's only about 1%. And in France, well, as we know, France doesn't keep racial data, so nobody knows. Um, but they are very clear that the, the shift to thinking about whiteness uh, is coming from the U.S. and that it's a problem. So, so now you have these wonderful spirals where, you know, a, a French politician can say, what are these ideas coming from the United States? And, and we say, well, it's, it's Sartre. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I'll just sort of end here by saying that one of the movements that has been important to me in my current understanding of whiteness is the indigenous land back movement, um, simply because if, if I start to think about um, my own uh, being white and how that's a form of power and not privilege, it has to do with resources. And so the primary resource that um, I have as a white person is the land uh, that I'm on. And so trying to understand how SART might connect with um, uh, in indigenous studies and especially the land back movement um, might be very important. So I am going to stop there. Thank you very much.